Hello, and welcome to this Deakin University alumni webinar presented by Professor Ross Dowling, AM. Zizi Moscow here from the Deakin Alumni Engagement Team. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from where I'm broadcasting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nations, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This webinar is presented in conjunction with Deakin's Perth Alumni Chapter, and will examine the cruise industry in light of the coronavirus crisis and look to the future of the industry post COVID-19. Our presentation will run for about 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A session with our presenter. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and submit and we will get to as many questions as possible during the discussion time at the end. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted online and you will receive an email with a recording link as well. Our presenter today, Professor Ross Dowling AM, is a proud Deakin alumnus and Vice President of Deakin's Perth Alumni Chapter. He is also an environmental scientist who is an honorary professor of tourism in the School of Business and Law at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. He is Chair of Cruise Western Australia, an advisor to the Australian Cruise Association and a co-founder of the International Cruise Society. He has been teaching a university unit, Cruise Ship Tourism, since 2004 and has edited two global books on cruise ship tourism. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, CZ. So uh, welcome everybody. And it's just so uh, grateful, I'm grateful that you're joining us, choosing to join me today on this very exciting topic of the future of the cruise industry. As we know, it's been a, a incredibly challenging time for the world, no matter what country we're in at the moment, and no more so than for the cruise industry. So we're gonna have a look at that today. The uh, first thing that I'd like to look at is just to share with you that I have been teaching, as CZ said, uh, cruise ship tourism for 16 years now as a university course. It was the second course in the world uh, to be presented at a university. So I've got uh, students here in Australia, as you can see on the left hand side of the screen. I have also taught the unit in Singapore for many years and in recent years also in Sri Lanka. So a number of our students uh, there around the world. And as Cezy also said, I've written a couple of major books. These are edited books, one in 2006, Cruise Ship Tourism, a second edition three years ago, 2017. And this covers, these books cover the world of cruising. So. There's many, many chapters written by many people around the world in these books. So if you want to know more, they're available, especially the 2017 one. It's available uh, online and uh, it's also available in hard copy. As CZ said, I, I've been lecturing on cruise ships now for around about uh, 20 years. So each year for 20 years, I've, I've traveled all over the world from the Antarctic to the Arctic and uh, across most countries uh, throughout Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, etc., giving lectures on board ships. So I certainly get to see a lot of the cruise industry. So today I'm going to talk about five things. One, the cruise industry, I'll introduce it. Two, I'll quickly talk about COVID-19. The third area will be the cruise industry and COVID-19. Uh, part four, we'll look at the cruise industry's response. And finally, I'll share a little about the future of the cruise industry. Now you can see a photo of me a few years ago there on board a ship with a, a couple of young uh, uh, staff members, one from, on the left from Spain, the one on the right from Germany. These uh, women have degrees from universities. They speak five or six languages and they are acting as social hostesses on board uh, a major cruise line. And then the cartoon on the right sums up a different view of the world of cruising now. We're here on a 
tropical island, you know, the person there is representing maybe the country by saying, no, no, we don't want the cruise ships here. And so he's trying to hide from the cruise ship uh, as it goes past. So let's look, begin by looking at the cruise industry. This will be brief. Most of what I share today will be just uh, visual clips. But at first, we just want to set the scene. So the first thing I want to note is the first cruise ship was introduced in 1817. This is much earlier than the first commercial air flight in 1914. So the cruise industry is 200 years old, whereas the airline industry for travel and tourism is only 100 years old. So we mustn't forget that it's got a very long history. Cruising's boomed at various times, but in the late 1900s, uh, carnival cruises uh, started with what was called their Mardi Gras fun ship. You can see it top right there in 1972. And the Carnival Cruise Corporation basically with this ship changed cruising and, and made it into more or less a fun uh, time to go out and uh, enjoy good food and hospitality and also have fun. And that was a change from the past. Today, that Carnival Cruise Corporation, remembering starting in 1972, less than 50 years ago, is now worth US $45 billion and is the major cruise corporation in the world and also one of the largest entertainment organizations in the world. So the cruise industry has survived uh, over a long period of time. It survived two world wars, it survived SARS and many other setbacks. But up until the end of 2019, just six months ago, it was booming. So much so that that ship on the bottom right hand corner, Symphony of the Seas, that is the world's largest cruise ship at 228,000 tons. That is an absolute monster and uh, would probably, if it arrived in port, it would bring more people than probably uh, 12 uh, A380 aircraft. So it is a big monster cruise ship. That's the world of cruising today. So if we have a look at the next uh, slide here, it's cruise and tourism in 2019. Three key points here so that we've got uh, 30 million cruise tourists in the world in 2019, but 1.5 billion international tourists. So you can see there that uh, it's really only 2% of the world of travel and tourism is in uh, cruise tourists. So if we have a look at this next slide entitled the growth of cruising. This is a little snapshot showing the growth of cruising over the last 10 years, basically from 2009 when there were 17.8 million people cruising that year to 2019 when there was 30 million passengers cruising last year. And the prediction was that there would be 32 million passengers this year. And of course, we know that that hasn't happened. And where are these passengers coming from? Well, if you have a look on this slide, it's uh, mainly half of them are from North America, mainly the USA. That's the home of cruising. The second major source of passengers is Western Europe, 6.7 million. So basically they're uh, a quarter comes from Western Europe. And then the rest come from other parts of the world, mainly Asia, 4.2 million, and Australasia, this area of Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific, where in 2018, there was one and a half million people cruising. And another fact about cruising, showing the global economic impact from 2018, the latest figures we have, in that year, 28.5 million passengers, but 1.177 thousand uh, jobs, so 1.2 million jobs in cruising, worth about 50 billion US dollars in wages and salaries, and the whole industry worldwide was worth 150 billion US dollars. So by 
tourism standards. This is a big player within the world of travel and tourism. And there's four big cruise corporations. Now, if we see here on the screen, Carnival, uh, top right, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian in the middle, Genting, Hong Kong at the bottom. Now, each of these, if you can imagine, each one is like a major car company. So Carnival could be like the Toyota car you know, company. And so within Toyota, it has lots of different types of cars. They might be Toyota, uh, Land Cruiser, Toyota, Prado, Toyota, Camry, etc. whatever you have in your country. They're all different cars within Toyota. Well, all these cruise corporations have different cruise lines. So Carnival has about nine or 10 cruise lines within this big corporation. And Royal Caribbean has about six, Norwegian has four, Genting has three, and so on. So these are the big main cruise corporations, but they represent a huge number of cruise lines. So that's my overview of the world of cruising. The second part of what I want to share today is, well, what happened? How have we gone from a projected 32 million cruise passengers this year to virtually none? Well, of course, as we all know, it was COVID-19 hit the world. And uh, this here is saying that on the 31st of December, 2019, the world Health Organization's China office first heard about it. And then we moved rapidly forward to a month later, January the 30th, when the World Health Organization declared a global health emergency. And this was followed uh, not long later, when on March the 11th, when there was a worldwide uh, rapid rise in the number of cases and deaths. So the World Health Organization Director General there on the 11th of March this year, less than, well, three months ago, he declared that now it was a pandemic. Interestingly enough, I was working with my wife on a cruise ship right up until March the 5th. So we were on cruise ships, uh, a, a cruise ship working uh, until less than a week before the pandemic was announced. And then of course, following from that, uh, international travel suddenly started to stop uh, or slow down all around the world. And so the world of tourism was rapidly suddenly coming to a halt. And during that time, COVID was rising. So for the countries that are represented here today on our talk, as people are listening from a number of countries, including Australia, when I made this talk on the 15th of June, uh, nine days ago, there were 7.8 million cases of COVID-19 in the world and 435,000 deaths. I just checked 30 minutes ago and the latest John Hopkins uh, coronavirus figures for the world uh, now, instead of 7.8 million cases, 9.2 million cases. And in the latest figures on the number of COVID related deaths in the world, it's risen from 435,000 to 477,000. So you can see it. there's no slowdown here. It's, it's risen 10% just in the last nine days. In Australia, where maybe a number of people are listening, we have 7,500 cases and 103 deaths. So by world standards, we are extremely lucky here in this country. Others like Vietnam are too. There's, it's not just Australia. There's a number of countries that are doing very well during this time of COVID. So if we move now to the third of the five parts of which I I uh, want to share today. In, uh, it says there on the uh, 23rd, I think of March, what happened was the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they put out this paper and they said, we've got a problem 
with cruise ships. And so they were, this was the first time we really were alerted, hey, there's, there's a problem here with COVID and cruising. So on the left-hand side there, I want to look at uh, five cruise ships. They're all from one cruise corporation, Royal Caribbean, and they're all from one cruise line, Princess Cruises. So let's have a look at these five just quickly in turn. The first one was the Diamond Princess, and the world first heard about this ship when it became a center for coronavirus, the first one outside of Wuhan in China. So this ship here, it says here that at the bottom of the uh, page there, you'll see it's, it's talking about the uh, cruise ship on the 3rd of February being quarantined. And finally, after many, many weeks and uh, even about a month, it was confirmed that that cruise ship had generated 712 cases of COVID and 14 deaths. So that was quite significant at the time. And included in that number was the first person in Australia to die of COVID and he was a travel agent from Western Australia where I'm based, a good friend of mine, James Kwan. And unfortunately, he was the very first Australian to die of COVID-19 and he caught it on this very cruise ship uh, here, the Diamond Princess in Yokohama, Japan. We have a look at the next slide here. some reason I can't do it, but we've got it. Thank you. Maybe Zizi did that or Sam. Thank you. Uh, the Grand Princess uh, here is a second ship. It's another uh, cruise ship in the Princess Stable. Now, here it is passing under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, USA on the 9th of March. And it is uh, just returning from a time over in uh, Hawaii. Now, this picture shows National Guard's uh, people uh, being helicoptered down onto the ship with COVID-19 testing kits. What happened here was the ship was coming back into US waters and it's radioed ahead and said, look, we've got some COVID cases on board. And President Trump at the time said, probably tweeted, but he said, we don't want the ship in American waters because we don't want COVID deaths here from that ship. Now, most of the passengers on board were Americans, so that was a very strange thing to say. But he didn't want the ship coming in because he said, it'll add to our COVID death numbers, so I don't want this. So he sent out the National Guard by helicopters, uh, tested everybody on board, and in the end, it was declared an emergency. So the Grand Princess did go into San Francisco. It did not dock at San Francisco's normal passenger wharf. It was docked at Oakland, a container ship terminal uh, on instruction of the president. And in the end, though, there was 122 cases and seven deaths there. I'll just click again. Yep, got it. So the third one is the Sun Princess. Just want to talk about that. And uh, this is one where there's no COVID deaths. But you can see already on the 1st of March, this other princess ship is sailing around the Indian Ocean, being banned by countries. They don't want it to land. And in Reunion Island, when it arrived on its scheduled visit, the local uh, people went to the wharf, threw sticks, rocks, lit fires, and basically turned the ship back. Said, we don't want the ship to come here because you've probably got COVID on board. In actual fact, they didn't have COVID on board. Right, so the four for the five ships here, or it might be the last one, is the Coral Princess. And this one here, it had 12 cases uh, of COVID, but out of the 12, three people died that ended up in Miami. And if we go to the next slide, 
we now look at the major one, the Ruby Princess. And for Australians, this became the symbol of COVID in our country. So the Ruby Princess docked in Western Australia, sorry, docked in Sydney and in March, and it had 852 cases of COVID and 22 deaths on board. So that was incredibly significant. So we saw headlines like this. Why was this death cruise allowed? You know, on the right hand side, having a shot at the uh, cruise lines, the Ruby Princess, the deadly cash cow. It, it sailed despite having COVID, etc. And it's been the uh, result also from that has been TV programs like a major documentary investigative program called Four Corners in Australia, which investigated that. Uh, I was asked to give a uh, comment there about the situation. And then moving on, it's become a, the focus, the cruise ship of a police criminal investigation. It's the second one down. It's become also another special commission of inquiry has been carried out by the New South Wales government as to why so many people caught COVID and why so many people died. And now there's even a legal class action uh, being carried out against the cruise ship and line by the passengers. But I want to put some perspective around all this and just show you that there's been 77 deaths on cruise ships. There's been 400 and it says here 35,000 deaths from COVID, but we know as of today, 477,000 deaths from COVID worldwide. So cruise deaths actually only comprise a very, very minor percentage. It says here 0.018% uh, of COVID-19. Well, with the latest figures, it's only 0.15%. So I think the cruise industry has been unfairly targeted. When you look at the number of deaths worldwide, close now to half a million, but only 77 deaths on cruise ships. There's a picture of me on the left hand side at the bottom with my wife and, and we're sitting on a cruise ship there enjoying a meal, a Japanese meal at a Nobu restaurant on board the Crystal Symphony uh, around New Zealand at exactly the same time that Ruby Princess was there, but there was no COVID on our ship. But here is the, uh, a very telling slide here where it says globally, 77 deaths on cruise ships, like 100% of all cruise ship deaths is 77 people. On Princess Cruises, there's 46 of those 77 died, and that's 60%. And then the Ruby Princess, one ship, there was 22 deaths. So that's 30% of all passengers on cruise ships who died in the world came from one ship. So as one of my students this semester said to me, or said to our class when we were talking about all this, he said, there really needs to be an investigation, not only into the Ruby Princess, but also Princess Cruises, the line, as to why one cruise line generated 60% of all the cruise deaths. And I'm going to say also that don't forget about the crew because many of the crew also have been stranded on cruise ships. A few have died, mainly passengers, but a few of the 77 are crew. But, uh, you know, there is a picture of 16 or 17 cruise ships which are now tied up, sitting, lying idle in Manila Bay, the Philippines. And they've got crew on board. Many of them can't get home. And so they're really, uh, you know, this is a worrying situation. You'll see in the bottom right hand corner there, a book called The Seafarer's Mind. And that there is being written by a German man who's a friend of mine, Martin Otto. And uh, we talk about, you know, seafarers, those people working on ships generally, not only cruise ships, but ships all around the world. And I've uh, endorsed that book as a very good book that's just come out this year. All right, we're moving on down to the second to last part of what I wish to share today. We've learned so far about the cruise industry. It's very big. We've learned about COVID. It's very severe and challenging for the world this year. We've learned about COVID and cruise, and we've said it has, you know, affected 
the cruise industry to the extent the cruise industry is completely shut down. But we ha have also learned that it's only pockets of the cruise industry, just as COVID is only in certain, uh, you know, really devastating in certain countries of the world. Other countries have been relatively unscathed, as have many cruise ships. Now, Australia and also America have extended their ban of cruise ships till September. And we have here a global response on COVID-19 has come out from the Cruise Line International Association, CLIA, which is the major industry body for the cruise world. And they've said, we're going to make absolutely sure when we start selling again, that we have a very clear response to COVID. And so here at the next slide, we've got here, Sea Trade Cruise News on the 7th of April, uh, Genting, which is Genting Hong Kong, which owns Star Cruises, Dream Cruises and Crystal Cruises. It's saying, we're going to do a whole lot to, uh, ensure cruising is safe when we return. The CLIA at the bottom, it says it's developing a new health policy so that cruisers can feel safe once they cruise again. I was asked to comment on this on May the 18th in an Australian uh, magazine called Escape, what will cruising look like post COVID? So, and I'm saying there, the uh, green items at the bottom there, that there'll be temperature checks now, probably more bionic bartenders, there'll be sterilization robots, there'll be, we'll be managing social distancing, there'll be a much greater emphasis on hygiene and health in future. Norwegian, the third biggest cruise corporation in the world has a new sail safe program second paragraph down is talking about six key areas of health and safety measures they're implementing uh, fleet wide and if we go now to the final part this is the part that uh, really you know was the headline of of this talk well what's going to happen now to the cruise industry will it come back is it, some people have predicted COVID calls the end of cruising. Others are saying, no, it'll continue just like it has before. So what do I think is going to happen? Well, let's just have a look here. This uh, article here from Fast Company is saying there's more people ready to go back on a cruise than you'll think. So passengers are very keen, you know, former passengers are very keen to go cruising. Cruising has an 82% repeat passenger rate. That is extremely high. 82% of people who go on a cruise go on at least one more, if not a whole lot more. So that it is a market driven um, form of tourism. They can't build the ships quick enough uh, to cater for all the people wanting to cruise. Hold on. Next one. Yep. Is the telegraph. So this is a uh, article from England and it's saying that cruising will be back to normal in a year, says TUI. TUI is a major uh, operator. You'll see at the very start of the article there, it says TUI is the world's biggest travel agent. And so it is, you know, it's predicting on the 1st of May, hey, you know, we'll return to normal. The world's biggest cruise corporation, Carnival, here's the CEO, Arnold Donald. He said on April 15th, two months ago, cruising will return. And he's already was saying, we've got strong bookings for 2021. The second biggest cruise corporation in the world, Royal Caribbean uh, Cruises, RCL. They say, we're going to return to sailing on the 1st of August. Well, they can't. Uh, because it's now the 17th of September at least. But they're all ready to go. They've got lots of uh, people booked and their cruise ships are ready. And if we have a look at the third major cruise corporation, Norwegian, it's saying they've got a boost of positivity. 
they, they've got voyages ready to go to every continent, including Antarctica, 20 new destinations planned. So they're all ready to go. They've got plenty of people who've booked. And Ponant, which is a France's only cruise line, I've lectured on board the Ponant ships, they're very high in luxury. They're set, they're ready and waiting to go. So, you know, there's, this is on the 25th of May, exactly a month ago. So you can see the major cruise lines there saying, we've got strong bookings, we're ready to go whenever we're allowed. If you have a look at the ship builders, Fincantieri in uh, Italy, they're positive, they're upbeat. They're saying, hey, we're, we're still building ships, we've still got orders, we're ready to go. And Clark Expeditions, which is a uh, expedition cruise line, I've lectured on their ships in the Antarctic, they've just floated out a new cruise ship. They're, they're ready to fly. So you can see there's strong growth there from passengers, from cruise corporations, from uh, shipbuilders. Well, what about travel agents? Here is an Australian travel agent, Cruise Traveller. It's set on the 30th of April. Um, their bookings were up 27% for next year. And Cruise Eco, which is one of the biggest cruise operators here, they see a lot of optimism in the future. And so, again, cruise passengers, what pandemic is the headline on the 11th of May? Carnival cruise booking saw 600% for August trips. So you can see there is a huge amount of positivity here. So it all comes down now to one slide. This is it. This is the final slide. Basically, I'm, I've been asked by... Uh, I've been interviewed on television, on radio, I've been in newspapers, I've been all over Australia giving uh, uh, the same, I've been asked the same question. What is the future of the cruise industry? And basically, this is what I think. I think there'll be limited national cruising this year. In fact, right now, Hurdy Grutten, which is a Norwegian expedition uh, cruise line, They've got a cruise ship traveling between Britain and Norway right now. It's already sailing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's in a little bubble there. So already there's some cruising happening. The, uh, a lot of uh, um, people are predicting that even though COVID started in China, cruising will probably be the first, that'll be the first place cruising goes, starts. So the big cruise corporations are ready to go straight back into China now. Whether they do or not, we're not sure. But I predict overall limited national cruising this year. I predict there'll be growing international cruising next year. There, it depends if we've got a second wave of COVID in the world and some places are starting to see that, or even a third wave has been talked about like in Britain. So if COVID is kept more or less under control. If it's growing at the moment, we can see that from our figures. But if it is, if it doesn't keep growing, if sometime soon it's starting to see a bit of a downturn in numbers, then there'll definitely be growing international cruising in 2021. If that happens, there'll be a return to normal in 2022. And by 2023, four years time, I think we'll start to see the numbers grow again in cruising. So that's my talk. There's my email address. I'm very happy to uh, for anyone to to uh, email me about what I've said at any time. I love the world of cruising. It will come back. And uh, you, uh, you know, if you've got any questions, uh, I'll be very happy to take them. All right, thank you so much, Horace, for such an interesting presentation. Um, we'll start the discussion session in a moment. Uh, so now it's time for attendees to write any questions you have in the Q&A box on your screen and then submit. We'd love to hear from you. Um, just a reminder as well that you will receive a copy of the recording from today's session by email. Um, this will come through at the close of the session, um, just in case you'd like to review the slides at all. Um, so just as you're writing your questions, we've received um, we've received a through during during the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll start with this one that we've got over here from 
Michael. Um, so Michael's asking us, Ross, he's asking, as a former cruise um, satisfied customer with Carnival, the question is how do we load 3,000 of pa odd passengers back into these into these cruise ships and how, um, will there be a quarantine period prior to departure? Will there be a quarantine period um, after departure? And how will this sort of look like in terms of moving forward? Yeah, very good question, Michael. Um, the big cruise ships uh, have always been problematic in that they've got so many passengers, 3,000, but also uh, up to 5,000 now. And even just in normal times, getting on board those ships is a big problem. There's queues, etc. Just like if you'd queued to go to a nightclub or a football stadium, you'll know if you've been on those ships. And, but will we have quarantine? No, we won't see quarantine. If we've got to have quarantine periods, then I can assure you there won't be any cruising happening. What there will be is temperature checks uh, before going on board. There'll be uh, disclosures which you have to make, which will be legal documents to, to medical staff pre-boarding. And assuming you're okay, you'll be all right. You'll get on the ship. But if you're not, then you'll be absolutely denied boarding. Another uh, part of your question, Michael, was about the crew. And I agree, the crew there, that's, that's a different story. They're, they're living and working in very much close quarters. But globally, you will see there wasn't too many crew who died on these cruise ships. They are basically, you know, uh, taking, being taken very good care of by the medical staff on board the ships. So that's as much as I want to say at the moment. Thank you. So we've received another question through from Damien. Um, more about the sustainability of the business model for cruise ships. Um, considering, so Damien asked, considering the close proximity of passengers, increasing passenger capacity per ship, difficulty of social distancing, distancing crew that tend to live and sleep in close contact and many elderly passengers. Um, how how is this kind of fit into this new this new um, way forward with cruising and yeah. um, all those health practices? Yeah, a good uh, question, Damien. Um, and that's the that's the key, isn't it? Is it sustainable going forward when we have so many people, so many crew on board? You know, you're jammed in a in, in a very confined area. You've got uh, often many elderly passengers, some of whom may you know, may have sickness, etc. So is it sustainable post-COVID? I think it is, provided we now pay much greater attention to hygiene and health. Uh, I see you've got a related question there. It, was it only a matter of time for a very serious infectious disease to break out across the cruise industry? The answer to that is probably yes. I don't think the, the uh, cruise industry was prepared for that. They have always uh, had to deal mainly with just norovirus, which is uh, like coronavirus, but not deadly, obviously. So norovirus has been in the cruise industry for years and pretty much being dealt with and contained. But this coronavirus took the virus, you know, situation on cruise ships to another level. So your question, was it a matter of time before you'd have this serious infectious disease in the cruise industry? Uh, yep, it was only a matter of time and we've seen it. So a very good question. Thanks, Damien. All right, so we've got another question come through um, from Terence Chung. Terence is actually the president of our Perth Alumni chapter. So thank you, Terence. Um, so Terence asks, compared to other areas of tourism, how does cruising perform? Will airline travel recover faster or cruising? Look, thanks for that, uh, Terence, and uh, great to have you as my president of the Deakin Alumni Chapter. And, you know, what's going to happen here is that uh, cruising will be, it, it's performed remarkably well. Uh, cruising has been the big driver and a key performer in the tourism industry. And your second question there is, will airline travel recover faster or cruising? Well, cruising is dependent on airline travel to a large extent, not solely. So therefore, they'll both have to recover. I mean, right now, as we sit here, wherever we are in the world, uh, America's got airlines. If you have a look at the air travel map of, of, say, Australia, there's a few airlines. You know, you see a few planes tracking across the sky. Look at New Zealand, only a very few. 
look at America, it's just a complete, it's completely covered. Uh, so airlines have, have been continuing to fly all over America right through COVID. So airlines globally, um, once they start to fly again, um, then cruising will take off. They go hand in hand. All right, thank you. Um, so we received another question come through from Ryder. Um, so Ryder asks, will the pause on the cruise industry give rise to more environmentally cruise, um, friendly cruise liners or will it be, um, be business as usual? Okay, so it'll give, I think it'll give rise, Ryder, I think it will give rise to more environmentally friendly cruise lines. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist, as was noted at the start of our presentation, but now working in uh, the cruise industry. And I, I think that that's one of the major uh, areas that the cruise lines need to look at. They need to be more environmentally friendly. I remember a few years ago being asked at a global conference of the key cruise industry people that they said, well, what do you think? Do you think that uh, we are very environmentally friendly? And I went right through in a, in a three quarter hour keynote talk to the key players of the cruise industry and said, no, you're not environmentally friendly. So I think now is a time to do probably three things for the cruise lines. One, they need to fully address hygiene and health to make their customers, the passengers, and crew safer. That's the first thing. Secondly, yes, it's a good time to be more environmentally aware, more environmentally friendly. And the third thing, obviously, is in regard to possible terrorism. Uh, you know, we've had airlines, hotels, buses, trains attacked by terrorists but so far, no cruise ships. So there's another good time to put a pause button there and say we need to also make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep the cruise lines and the passengers and crew safe. So a good question. Thank you. All right. Another question has come through from an anonymous, from an anonymous attendee. And um, the question is, do you foresee the cruise industry becoming more accountable and subject to new regulations in international waters? Um, not just from the pandemic, but for when situations arise, be it death, criminal um, situations, or passengers treated unfairly or not provided information that's detrimental to their health. How do you, how do you see that accountability perhaps changing? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a very good question there. The, you know, the cruise industry is so big, I haven't touched on certain things today uh, through time. But one of them is the fact that, uh, you know, most of the cruise lines are registered in, you know, ports or countries of convenience. They're called flags of convenience countries, where really they're like Liberia, Panama, you know, Bahamas, etc. And the reason the cruise lines have done that is because of tax, they're dodging tax, but they're also, they don't have to then maybe, uh, you know, by regulation of countries like America or Australia, you know, pay fair wages, look after the environment, etc. So I think that what we're going to see in future is that, you uh, there'll be a big shake-up right now. You know, coming out of this will be a big shake-up in the cruise industry. Passengers will demand better environmental, uh, you know, regulations on board, better health systems on board, fairer pay for the crew, um, you know, better conditions all around for, for people in the cruise area. So, yeah, this is going to bring a big, a series of big changes, I think. So, a good question. Mm. Um, we've received another question that's come through from Lauren. So Lauren's asking um, with regards to cruising with her elderly parents. Um, she wanted to know how will we know when it's safe to cruise again? Um, her family was planning to do a cruise to New Zealand this year and then do a transatlantic cruise in three years' time. I think, um, yeah, there's interest in the audience for, for knowing when, when it would be safe and gauging that for elderly passengers particularly. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, good question. I, I'm a Kiwi and I uh, often give lectures all around uh, on the cruise ships around New Zealand. It will be safe when the ships go back. I can assure you of that. They are working 
overtime now with the, they have to, with the American authorities, with the American health and uh, legal authorities, they're working overtime here in Australia to ensure that when the cruise ships are allowed back at the moment, countries are saying, like America and Australia, you cannot have any international cruise ships uh, happening at the moment in these countries until uh, September. It may, that may be pushed out even further. So it may not be this year, but I can assure you that it will be safe when, when you come back. Some people have said to me, well, maybe it wouldn't be safe unless they got an anti-COVID vaccine and that everybody that went on board had to take that. I actually don't see that happening. I see that the cruise lines, the ones I've spoken to and about today, many of them are going to put massive uh, amounts of health and hygiene measures uh, into their ships. So would I be traveling to New Zealand with my elderly parents? No, not this year. Uh, I would leave it until maybe this time next year. I'd leave it 12 months and then I would do a transatlantic maybe the year after. I would give it some time. I'm just talking to you as a friend here, Lauren, not as a spokesperson for the industry. I'm just sharing my gut feeling is I wouldn't like to take my elderly parents on a cruise ship just yet. I would wait and just see what's happening in the industry first. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Russ. Um, so we've got a question coming through, I guess, stemming from all the changes that cruise ships will need to be making. Um, Gary asks, do you think cruise prices will increase due to the cruise line losses and um, the change in circumstances? The short answer, Gary, is yes, uh, they already have. Uh, I've spoken to many people who uh, were booked on a cruise this year. Uh, the cruise line has contacted them and said, we'll give you, you know, you can, you can have 100% credit and put it to the same cruise next year. And when, the, you know, my friends or prospective passengers have gone to book the one next year, they find the cruise prices already have, have lifted for next year. So there is going to be uh, an increase uh, in cruise lines uh, prices, I think, to make up for some of the losses. But cruise lines tend to work on, they give you a cheap price for the cruise, but then they charge you extras for everything on board. That's where they make their money. So maybe, you know, we might see the cruise prices of taking a cruise stay at about the same or maybe 10 or 20 percent uh, dearer maybe but once you're on board then you're captured so they can charge what they like of course they'll have to go up these cruise lines uh, the big cruise corporations are making you know billion dollar losses each month so they can't keep going like that and when they finally start to cruise again they'll need to uh, you know recapture some of the money lost so they'll do it by charging more Great. Um, so we've got another question on um, the resilience of the industry and what does this consist of um, from an anonymous attendee? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Sorry, I missed that one. Say that oh, one again. Sorry. Um, so we've got a question that's come through. Um, yeah. What does resilience um, oh, yeah. industry consist of? Yeah, industry's resilience. Well, basically the, the resilience <laughs> over 100 or 200 years it consists of people just want to cruise. That's, that's the, res, the, the resilience. There is more people wanting to cruise than you've got cruise ships in the world. So that's what's kept it going. And also what's kept the cruise industry going, why it is so resilient, is that it's moved from being just a, a, a mode of transport from, say, uh, you know, England to America across the Atlantic or through the Pacific, uh, to Asia. Instead now, of course, you know, the cruise ships are destinations in themselves. I've been on many cruise ships, no doubt some of you have been too, where you've seen passengers in ports don't even get off the ship. They don't want to. They're, they're, they're having such a good time on the, the cruise ship. It is like a mega resort. So the resilience is that uh, two, uh, three things really. One is that, that it's, there's high demand. The second thing is it's very accessible. Cruise ships now have moved 
post 9-11 from a model where it was fly crews to now where cruise ships are positioned in many ports around the world. So you don't have to fly to get to your cruise ship. Uh, so, you know, many, like in Australia, it used to be to cruise, you need to cruise out of Sydney or Melbourne. That was it. You had to go there. Today, you can cruise out of Darwin, out of, um, you know, Cairns, out of Brisbane, and so on, all the way around, including Perth. So that's the second thing, um, high demand, accessibility. And the third thing is affordability. Cruise lines, uh, to take a cruise, it's always been a lot cheaper than to pay the individual portions of going to a resort overseas, paying for your airline ticket, paying for the resort or hotel accommodation, and then paying for all the entertainment and food and wine and extras, etc. So cruise lines are being pretty affordable. If you just go on a cruise ship and, you know, just take everything that's free on board, you actually have had a very good value for money uh, holiday experience. So that's the resilience as I see those three things that uh, there is, you know, accessibility, affordability and high demand. Thank you, Ross. Um, just a few more questions before we wrap up. So we've got a question from David. How do you think um, social distancing measures will impact cruise bookings for conferences in the future? Uh, yes, that will be a problem. You know, social distancing will Im definitely impact uh, bookings for conferences. But the way I hear it is that um, when cruises go back, that there'll be, you know, like in the main entertainment areas, instead of just having an open situation whereby the passengers can go to a show, you'll have to register. And it might be if the seating capacity of the auditorium is 1,000, they might say, you know, 500, 600 people only are allowed in and you'll have to social distance. So if you're in a group, you can sit together, but then there has to be a space before the next group. So obviously this will also impact bookings for conferences on cruise lines, because if you know you are holding a cruise conference in a, uh, in, in a boardroom or large meeting rooms on board the ships and you have to socially distance, then you know, the figures just aren't gonna work. And, and that's the same on land too. So I've got the same situation here. I run many conferences same situation for resort-based conferences on land. It, at the moment, it doesn't work. So we have to, it'll only work once social distancing is, uh, is no longer the case. All right, so we've got a question from an anonymous attendee with regards to cruise lines and the support available to their workers. Um, you spoke a little bit about this during your presentation, but um, we've had a question asking with regards to mass layoffs and just general support that's been available to those within the industry. What's been happening there? Uh, again, this is a, uh, a very you know, thorny issue. Some cruise lines have supported their workers very well, have tried to get them home, back to their home countries, Philippines or, or wherever. Uh, others haven't. And there's been, uh, a bit today with the world of social media, there's been a number of uh, cruise workers who have said, look, we're trapped here on the cruise ship. We can't get off. Um, you know, we want to fly home. And even if we got off, we can't fly home from where we are. We feel like we're in a jail type thing. There's no work for them. They're, they're just trapped. So there has been, it hasn't been widely reported, but I have tracked it. There has been a, a, an increase in suicides and attempted suicides from uh, workers that are, that are just feeling like, you know, their, their life has come to an end. They're trapped on this cruise ship, not going anywhere. So that's at one, one extreme. At the other, there's been, you know, very good attempts to try and get people uh, home. Uh, the crew home to their home countries during this time. And I just noted in the cruise media yesterday that the UK, for example, has uh, basically taken charge of five ships there, all on cruise and maritime voyages. So one cruise line, it's taken its five ships and taken control of them, the UK government, because it wants to repatriate the international workers from those ships, especially the Indians, back to India. So, you know, the government's had to step in and do that. So to answer your question, you know, some cruise 
workers have been well treated, others haven't. And this is a real problem and a growing problem. So yes, and also you asked, I think the question, post COVID, will there be as many jobs? Well, obviously no, because already like Carnival, it's sold in a fire sale. The biggest cruise corporation in the world's just sold five or six ships to, you know, to, to raise money. And so they won't, you know, it'll take a while for those ships to maybe start with another cruise line. There won't be as many cruises happening. So there will now be a drop in the number of people um, want, you know, that the cruise lines need to work on their ships. All right. So unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for today. Um, thank you once again to our Perth alumni chapter and also to our presenter, Professor Ross Dowling. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you, CZ. It's been a pleasure and thank you for everybody who attended today. I appreciate you giving up your valuable time to share with me. Please stay in touch. All right. Um, we'd love to stay in touch with you. So please make sure um, we have your contact information so we can invite you to relevant events and more. Um, your postal address allows us to invite you to events relevant to your area. So please be sure to update that as well. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn and check out our YouTube channel for webinar recordings and other great content. Um, just a reminder that Deakin alumni and their direct families are eligible for 15% off postgraduate course fees. Um, to find out more information about this offer, please visit the Deakin alumni website. Deakin is dedicated to supporting our students who have been affected by the global COVID-19 pandemic. The Student Emergency Assistance Fund distributes emergency grants of up to $500 to students experiencing financial distress. If you're in a position to do so, please consider contributing to this fund. Every dollar you give provides relief with 100% of your gift going directly to this vital support program. To watch past webinar and seminar recordings, please visit the webinar resources page on our Deakin alumni website. You can also visit our YouTube page to search for Deakin Alumni. You can submit any feedback about today's webinar to deakinalumni at deakin.edu.au. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you once again to our presenter, Ross, and thanks again to you for participating in this webinar. We wish you a great day.